So I'm Jen Murtazashvili. I run the Center for Governance and Markets here at the University of Pittsburgh. And it is a huge honor for us to have distinguished, such distinguished guests among us today. Uh, we're gonna lead this discussion on political polling. Uh, but before we do the introduction to the speakers, I just wanted to do a brief shout out to Professor Gail Rogers, uh, who is the Andrew, I gotta get the name right, Andrew W. Mellon, Professor and Chair of the English Department at the Dietrich School uh, of arts and sciences, and uh, he's affiliated with a number of centers. But I think this uh, his collaboration with us, the Center for Governance and Markets, is on the uses and abuses of prediction. And uh, this uh, speaker series uh, that we're so fortunate to have is, I think, the outgrowth of a lot of his work, including his most recent book, Speculation: A Cultural a Cultural History from Aristotle to AI, uh, which came out from Columbia. University Press last year. And so it's an enormous um, honor to have Professor Rogers leading this for us. And I will allow him to introduce our esteemed guests. And thank you, Professor Rogers, for putting this up today. Thank you. So thanks, everybody, for being here. And thanks to all of you in the, uh, the Zoom. Is this thing following me now? You'll see you like the side of you. Crazy. OK. So um, uh, so the, thank you, Jen. It's been great to. to Put this series together. Um, should I? Your face is oh, weird. Maybe I'll be over here. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I'm not used to this thing. Um, so I uh, know th this this series has, has been really really um, engaging to put together. This is this is um, part two of it. We've got more coming uh, later in the year. Um, but for today, uh, we have. Um, uh, a really exciting guest and uh, respondent, and then I look really forward to hearing what all of you um, have to say in, uh, in Q and A with them. So today we have uh, G. Elliot Morris, who is uh, staff data journalist and U.S. correspondent for The Economist. Uh, he writes about American politics, political opinion polling, demographics, and elections. Uh, he's responsible for many of the paper's election forecasting models, uh, including the 2020 U.S. presidential election forecast and polling models for several European countries. Uh, he writes for the Economist weekly checks and balance uh, newsletter on US politics. Uh, he is proficient in machine learning models, Bayesian statistics, and various tools in the standard social science toolkit. Uh, and I'll also add that he is the author of a new book as well, newer than that, um, <laughs> called Strength in Numbers, which I uh, highly recommend to anyone. It's a, a great account of why polling matters and why um, a lot of the rhetoric about polling these days is misguided, and what you can do to um, think about polling better and use polling better, which is going to be a topic of today's talk. Um, our respondent today is someone that many of you know, uh, Michael Colabisi, who is the William S. Teacher II, Chair of Political Science and the Research and Academic Director of Pitt Cyber, as well as the Director of the Pitt Disinformation Lab. They work on this intention, they don't listen. <laughs> His work leverages the accelerating availability of computational tools, including machine learning Bayesian approaches, along with unstructured information, uh, such as from digitized text, to build and improve models of information technology, democracies, national security, secrecy, and oversight, international interstate violence, and changes in human rights over time. He also develops computational visual tools that enable domain specialists to work alongside computer scientists to improve specific applications. In 2022-23, he is a fellow of the Stability and Change Program at the Center for Advanced Studies in Oslo, Norway. He was a co-editor of the journal International Interactions from 2014 to 2019 and the co-recipient of the Best Visualization Award in the Journal of Peace Research in 2017. Gosnell Prize. <laughs> where, do you, where do you keep the trophy? <laughs> and the Gosnell Prize. I was I was a runner up for the Gosnell Prize. <laughs> for excellence in political methodology from the methodology section of the American Political Science Association in 2006. His book, Democracy Declassified, which I also recommend, was short shortlisted for the 2015 Conflict Research Society Book Prize. He has been PI or co-PI on four NSF grants and is a research affiliate for the ERC-funded Violence Early Warning Project at the University of Uppsala in 
Peace Research Institute. At the University of Pittsburgh, he co-founded the new major in computational social science. And in his previous position at Michigan State, he, co he founded and directed the Social Science Data Mathematics Commission. So we'll first hear from Elliot, we'll have a response from Michael, and then we'll bring things up. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, on Zoom. And All right, well, thanks, Gail, for the generous introduction. I was not nominated for the Cosmo. <laughs> Just wait. Your time will pass. You would have won. Um, I'm going to talk to you about well, how polls work. This presentation is taken mainly from my new book, as Gail said. This. Um, that will click there. There we go. Um, is that okay with the Zoom? I think so. Um, and uh, we'll talk about a little bit about my work on election forecasting too. And we'll talk about why the polls were sort of wrong or what that means at all in the previous two elections. Um, what the pollsters are thinking about doing or thinking about doing about that and how in my election forecasting capacity, we're thinking about overcoming some of um, some of those shortcomings. Uh, but before we talk about polls, I want to talk to you about soup, uh, which may sound a little bit surprising, but bear with me. Um, there is a point here. Um, soup is a traditionally used tool to explain the science of survey sampling. That is how polls work in interviewing people and how those populations that are interviewed by a poll represent the broader population. In this case, or in the case of this presentation, Americans. And this principle or sort of theory, this explanation for how polls work is, is called the soup principle by the mathematician Jordan Ellenberg. So I'm going to adopt that. Um, and we'll talk about how this soup principle that the pollsters sort of market as good explanation for survey sampling might not be so accurate and what that means for how much we should, we should trust um, the polls. And to explain how the polls work, I kind of want to build us a foundation how have polls worked in the past, how they perform, and kind of how that's changed over time, um, and, and whether or not it's breaking down, whether or not polls today meet this soup principle, and then we'll define that. But first, let's talk about these first polls and maybe how they're kind of like soup. So this is an interesting screenshot from um, an interview show. I think this is on YouTube, where this man, Billy Eichner, who's a sort of Hollywood interviewer goes around yelling at people in New York City, asking them if they like know certain celebrities and typically giving them a dollar, but sometimes just yelling at them. Um, and I think it's interesting to think of early polls kind of as, as the same way as this. And, and these early polls are not scientific, just like Billy Eichner's polls or interviews are not scientific. Instead, what happened is a pollster, or in this early case, a journalist would go around to certain gatherings of people in the early 1800s and ask them, who are you gonna vote for? For president. In fact, the first example we have of a political poll in America is in 1824 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, not too far from here, um, where a reporter went to a military muster and asked the sort of roll call of the military who they were planning on voting for. Um, can I just say decline? Is that yes, uh, decline in domestic. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, hopefully. These people won't ask again. Um, uh, and the results were actually pretty accurate. They, they found that um, about 70% of the people in this roll call, about a, a couple hundred militia members said that they would vote for Andrew Jackson if they could vote for the upcoming um, election. And like 20% of people said John, that they would vote for John Quincy Adams, one of the other nominees that year. Um, and that was pretty close to the, uh, the results of that election. Now, so let's fast forward a couple hundred years. The polls typically kind of look like the Eichner interview going forward, um, where uh, newspapers, typically partisan newspapers, would send not just one interview, interviewer, but hundreds um, to different parts of the country or different parts of their state and ask who uh, people would vote for. And this had some mixed success. Um, pollsters also sent out mail ballots to people. They found people uh, on lists of owners of uh, telephones or automobiles, and they would mail them a postcard and say, check who you're going to vote for. So the most Famous example of this is in the 1936 election when the Literary Digest poll polled about 20 million Americans. That's who they sent postcards to. They got about 2 million postcards back um, asking them if they were going to vote for Alf Landon, the Republican nominee, or Franklin Roosevelt, the Democratic nominee. Um, and the Literary Digest straw poll, again, it's an unscientific poll because they're just getting the responses 
that they get back. They're not doing adjustments. They're not making sure the people who are talking them are representative of the public at all. Um, and, and those results are wildly inaccurate. In the Literary Digest's case, they find that Alf Landon has a, a 24 percentage point lead over Franklin Roosevelt, which turns out to be a disastrous misprediction. Um, in fact, after the election in which Franklin Roosevelt wins by about 38 percentage points, complete opposite, sorry, by 14 percentage points, making the Literary Digest 38 percentage points wrong, they run this cover and, <laughs> and they shortly go out of business after this famous um, misprediction. At the same time, uh, a new scientific version of polling is, is being invented. Remember when I said that the digest polls aren't representative because they just count the people who send mail ballots back to them. Now, that population turns out to be incredibly biased in the digest case because supporters of Alf Landed are more enthusiastic about them. Um, and they also draw their sample based you know, from people who own telephones and automobiles. Now, 1936, not a lot of people own telephones and automobiles. So the poll missed a lot of lower class Americans, working class Americans. So a man named George Gallup and some of his contemporaries, Elmo Roper, Archibald Crosley, they say, well, let's go face to face to Americans, to a representative portrait of Americans. And they, they establish that representativeness by interviewing a set quota of Americans, white Americans, black Americans, those that you know, lived in the South or the North, to make sure that the types of people they were talking to were representative of Americans based on demographics from the census. Um, and they, they did better. In 1936, the Gallup poll, in fact, estimated that the Digest poll was going to be wrong because they were talking to unre unrepresentative groups. Um, and Gallup's poll says Franklin Roosevelt's going to win by about 12 percentage points. Now, he still underestimates Franklin Roosevelt's margin of victory. I think that's important. The um, uh, that's OK. OK. Just worried that you might not be broadcasting. But I'll open up my comments. Keep talking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's um, uh, in, um, in, this, in, in this case, the Gallup poll proves that this formula, well, the formula you could see, of <laughs> cutting Americans into demographic slices and interviewing a representative portrait of them is a better, more scientific and more accurate way to conduct polls. And so straw polls go the wayside. The Eichner model of interviewing people on the street and counting that as a representative survey um, expires and pollsters move on to what I'll call, oh, still um, I'll call polls uh, to polls 2.0. Um, and polls 2.0 comes around after a misprediction of the new scientific surveys in 1940. Some of you will know this famous picture of Harry Truman holding an early copy of the pre-printed copy of the Chicago Tribune newsletter um, in which they proclaimed that his opponent, Thomas Dewey, has beat him in the election. And the reason that they printed this story was because these pollsters at the time had stopped polling the election and called it for Thomas Dewey. Um, showing that these scientific surveys are not foolproof. Um, and that's something needed to be done. So in, in my history of polling in the book, we turn next to a company, a sort of collection of survey scientists, political scientists, statisticians, who say these quota sampling polls uh, are not accurate enough. They um, still have the chance that the types of white or black or young or older Americans that are responding to the surveys are too partisan in one direction, pushing the surveys away from reality. So they say, don't pick the people off of the street or mail them ballots, but instead go to their door and make sure that the doors that you're knocking on are randomly selected by area. So you, I'm from Texas. So imagine that George Gallup is like slicing Houston into 12 different quadrants or 20 or whatever, each of them holding the same number of people. So that way you're getting, and, and then inside that sampling, you're also making sure you're talking to the representative um, uh, demographic quotes. So that way you're not only getting white Americans from say this part of Houston, but like all, all but, but, but the right number of them from all of Houston or to generalize from all America. So you're not only getting your respondents from certain parts of town that might be 
um, unrepresentative. And these quotas do a little bit better. Um, in 1948, uh, they, or sorry, 1952, um, they have slightly lower bias, but they're still wrong. There's still a fundamental problem in polling, which is that the area selection in this case still isn't reaching enough people. People won't answer the door. The interviewer is coding um, some younger people's older people, or, or there's just errors in the survey process because it's not scientific enough. Right. So by 1971, uh, a man named Warren Matofsky creates random digit dialogue. So now pollsters don't have to knock on doors. They don't have to assume demographic traits that people are interviewing. They can just call them. They can call them and they can ask and they can call thousands of people very cheaply. So it's also a lot cheaper to conduct these surveys. Um, and this is a case of technological change increasing the methodological quality of surveys. Surveys now get a lot better. Um, these polls I'll call 3.0 are about as close as we can get to truly representative of Americans because they're sampled randomly. Pollsters are still using quotas, but they're reaching a lot more Americans. Um, and because they're using random digit dialing on the telephone, basically everyone they're talking to has an equal-ish chance, and I'll explain equal-ish um, chance of responding to the survey. Um, there's rare instances of partisans selecting into taking the survey process because you're calling them directly, they're not answering the door, um, and they're cheaper. So we have more of them. And like I said, this works really well. So this chart shows you the error in national election predictions over time. You see this 12 percentage point error I was talking about from George Gallup in 1936. And you notice this pronounced Republican bias in the polls is essentially going away by the 1970s, where now the errors flip back and forth and they're much lower. So whereas in 1940, 45, 55, you would have expected the average poll to mispredict the margin for the presidential election by about six points, by the 70s, by the 80s, that error is half. That error is now about three percentage points. So if you have a candidate with a six percentage point lead, now you can be a little more confident on average that, that they're going to win um, the election. So so let's go back to soup now. So now we have a poll that is able to talk to most every American who has a landline or a cell phone at the time. That's or a landline at the time. That's most people because there aren't cell phones yet. Um, these people are randomly selected. So you sort of draw them from a sample. You're making sure you, there's not as much interviewer bias. Um, and and they're talking. They're they're answering the phone about 70 or 80 percent of the time. So people have faith in the polls. They're answering them. Quality is increasing. So let's talk about that soup principle again. That principle from the pollster says, if you have, for example, a pot of soup, and, and this pot of soup is sort of homogeneously mixed, like tomato soup, and, and you take a spoonful out of it, that spoonful is representative of the, the whole pot. So because you mixed it well, because it's homogenous, because you know, because it's soup, it's simple. Um, and so now we have this tool that is meeting kind of this soup principle where most Americans are answering the polls, they can reach most Americans, most people have phones, and they're doing pretty well. So are, you know, are these polls meeting this soup principle, this methodological sort of standard for whether or not you have a theoretically representative poll? Again, in theory, whether or not this is being conducted the right way. Um, yeah, maybe. Right? In 1970, you're sitting there, you're like, the polls are going to be good. They're going to be perfect forever because everyone's answering phones in 1970, 1980. Um, and you know, there's not as much political polarization. So if you talk to a pretty good mix of older, younger Americans, um, the, the polls do, do pretty well. But then the turn of the century happens. This graph from Pew shows, the Pew Research Center shows response rates to surveys are plummeting. So as they were 70 or 80% in the 70s, by the turn of the century, they're up to 30%. Later in the 2000s, they're down to 4 or 5%. Um, and this is a case of technological change hurting the polls. So as before, the invention or adoption of the telephone helped them. Now the adoption of the cell phone and decline of trust in society causing people not to answer their phones is going to hurt them. At the same time, America's going through a phase of rapid political polarization where different demographic groups 
are highly segregated who they're voting for. This is around the time, of course, when education polarization, when um, conservative or when Americans without college degrees start to become more conservative. We saw a very rapid shift in that over the past decade. That sort of starts around here. And that makes polling harder because it means you have to talk to representative groups or representative samples of these smaller subgroups. So now you can't just kind of ignore the non-college educated people. You can't just ignore the younger black people in your poll. You have to have representative samples of these smaller different dem demographic groups. And that makes polling harder. It means you have to interview more people. It means you have to count these people equally. Um, and, uh, and it means that the chance that, th that the survey is unrepresentative goes up. The chance of an election sort of prediction misfire increases. And that's because if you're not meeting this suit principle of survey sampling, if you don't have, if, if people don't have an equal chance of responding to your survey, then there's a higher chance that your, that your survey is, um, is unrepresentative. So this I think is the suit principle in theory, but in fact, I don't think we're sampling pollsters or sampling a tomato soup. I think maybe a better example is a minestrone soup. Well, where you have to sort of sample a bunch of different ingredients where it's not a homogenous mixture, but you have to sample, I guess in the case of of the soup, like noodles and tomatoes and zucchinis to have a good taste of what the survey looks like, just like pollsters have to sample um, smaller, smaller demographic subgroups. Um, and, and that is just to say that the soup principle is, is not met. The polls today are not soup. They're not theoretically representative based on the science of survey sampling. And that's because people aren't answering the polls anymore. That's because cell phones are hard to poll. Um, because response rates are low and because different groups, political groups are more or less likely to answer the polls if they're motivated by the candidate that they like um, or, or otherwise. So how do pollsters overcome that problem? How do they overcome the problem of their polls not being representative? Well, they can use statistics. So there, there's some methods that pollsters can use to make sure that they're talking to the correct share of white or black or younger poor or richer Americans. Um, a couple of these methods I detail in the book, we can just call them weighting and modeling. Um, this, the details of necessarily how the stuff works is not important. What's important is that this becomes a crutch for the pollsters to lean on, that they, that they can use surveys to make sure that the people they're talking to are representative along certain demographic traits of like race and age and education and region. Um, and again, we see an increase in survey quality as pollsters adopt Weighting methods um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, average error in polls does still decrease, um, even while pollsters aren't meeting these traditional sort of criteria, the soup principle, the, the science of, of survey sampling, but they're not technically representative. And that's important. Pollsters can force the poll to add up to the fresh share of Americans by demographic groups. But if they're still not getting the right share of Americans by their political affiliation, by their partisan behavior, then the polls can misfire. And, uh, and, and that's what happens in a few key examples. So in 2016, for example, um, pollsters fail to weight their samples by the interaction of race and education by making sure that they have the right percentage uh, of white non-college educated Americans, which they never had to do before. Um, and uh, in 2020, even if pollsters weighted by uh, the right demographic portrait of Americans, even if they made that right decision, which not all of them did, um, they had a problem reaching uh, the right share of Trump voters within those demographic groups. So if you had 40% you know, of the electorate being white, non-college educated, you're still not reaching enough sort of Trumpy Americans in the case of 2020. And this shows how weighting fails to force polls to meet the suit principle, to force them to be representative. And it means we have to expect a little more error from our surveys. So what, what are we left with with polls? Well, we've covered that traditional polls don't meet the suit principle. They aren't representative. Um, worse than that, when pollsters add all of these different weighting parameters, force the poll to be representative along too many demographic attributes, that means that um, there's a higher chance that 
any group that they're talking to being politically unrepresented increases the margin of error of the survey. Um, we have online polls, polls that are trying to reach Americans by text message um, that don't meet the suit principle and, uh, and um, are highly incumbent on researchers selecting the right variables, the right predictors of vote choice to be representative in theory. Um, and uh, as, as response rates have continued their longer term decline, um, these uh, problems only, only really get worse, not better. So pollsters have a few solutions. Um, one solution is to increase the number of variables they're waiting on. So if a poll has already been waiting on age and education, making sure the right you know, share of white or black Americans that are represented in the poll. Maybe they'll also make sure that it has the right share of white Americans from the rural South or the right share of high income Americans um, that are also white. And, and this is um, what the New York Times is doing this year. They think that they can sort of force the survey to be more representative after collecting their interviews, even if their interviews don't meet this traditional soup principle sampling. Um, there's uh, some pollsters who are saying, I'm, I'm not going to call people anymore. I'm going to send them a postcard to fill out a survey online. Um, or maybe if they don't respond to that postcard, I'll send them a follow-up postcard or 10 bucks. Or maybe if they don't respond to that, I'll print out the entire survey and mail it to them. Um, and so we have some mail, we have some mail polls again. Um, pollsters are also reaching people on SMS text, which has mixed results, but is a pursuit of finding um, respondents that previously weren't answering polls, meeting people sort of where they are, to try to get a balanced sample before all of these adjustments that pollsters are making to try to force their polls to be more representative, to meet the soup principle of surveys. Again, to try to um, force the surveys to be, uh, to be representative, meet the old criteria for how this should have um, this should have worked, but margins of error is still high, and it's really a guessing game whether or not any individual survey will will be right. Um, but I'm not a pollster. I am an election forecaster. I'm a polling aggregator. So I have some tricks. Let me see. I don't have to rely on any one survey. I can rely on several. I can average them together, and hopefully the errors in any one survey cancel out. Um, and I have a couple of other tools to hedge against that polling error, at least in theory, forecasters will tell you. Um, but to get there, now we understand how polls work. I want to say a little bit about how election forecasting works. And I think we have, I think we have enough time for that. Um, so I'll use the, the case of our 2020 election model at The Economist. Um, this election model worked in three stages. First, we come up with a prediction of the national popular vote for president based on things like, is the economy growing? Um, is there high polarization? How did the past, you know, how did the past election go? People like the president. Um, and then we turn that national prediction into a prediction of how every state's gonna vote. And that's what we call our fundamentals prediction for every state. And then we add the polls on top of that using some statistics. So I'll, I'll first um, just detail how those national fundamentals work. We gather all of these indicators for every election between 1940 and 2016. Again, this is from the standpoint of 2020. Um, and we train a statistical model to predict the results of those elections using those, using those indicators, using economic growth and, and approval um, at the time. And that allows us to sort of time travel. We're saying in 2020 with a President Donald Trump with low approval ratings with an economy, at least in 2008, middle of 2020 during the coronavirus pandemic that was shrinking, what would we expect for that president if they had sort of existed historically? And that's a good baseline, but it's sort of not perfect. Um, this, for example, would have been our forecast for the national popular vote based off of the economy. It would have predicted Donald Trump to get 40% of the vote, which you know, was significantly less than we actually got. Um, and his approval rating sort of shored up our prediction closer to putting, pushing it closer to, to 45 or, or 46%, uh, percent, and I'll skip that. Um, 
And then with that national forecast, we look at the histor history of how every state voted in national environments that lean four or five percentage points to the right or four or five percentage points to the left based off of a national prediction to come up with these baselines, these fundamental baselines of how, um, how every state was going to vote. And it's, um, it's important that we do this at the state level because elections in America are decided based off of the national um, popular vote, or sorry, the, the, the electoral college, not the national popular vote. So, um, well, how do the polls, how do these polls that don't meet our traditional idea of the polling come into this equation? Well, we average it. And our averaging method looks basically like this. We fit a curve using statistical models through the points that appear on our sort of chart. Imagine instead of being a wiggly line like this, you have time on your x-axis and democratic support in the polls going from left to right as you get closer to the election. And you can do that with any package you want in statistics. You can do it in a really fancy way. This is what our model looks like. And that's a particular, don't write that down. That's intellectual property. Um, <laughs> And, um, and we correct for a few things. Because we know that some polls are conducted better than others, some meet the soup principle better than others, some have a history of predicting election results, um, we want to let our model know those factors. So we average the polls and we let certain pollsters um, that uh, over or under predict election results for the president um, to have more or less weight or be adjusted by the model. We want the model to know if there are differences based on whether or not polls are being conducted over the phone or online, whether or not they're meeting likely voters or registered voters or all adults. Um, and we adjust for all these factors. In our attempt to correct for some of those problems for not meeting the suit principle that individual polls can come across. Um, and after the election in 2016, we had another parameter, which no one else really does. We say pollsters that go one step further from weighting by demographics to weighting by both demographics and politics, so that their surveys have the right share of, for example, 2016 Trump or 2016 Clinton voters. We want those surveys to kind of count more in the model. We want our model to know, are those theoretically more reliable polls um, showing systematically different results than all the other surveys. And the model can then adjust its prediction likewise. And this correction for non-response works in 2016. You see, for example, in Wisconsin, the, pur the purple dot is our prediction for um, the Democrat share of the vote. Uh, I'm sorry, actually the purple dot is the result and our model is the red dot. Um, our, our red dot comes closer to the purple point than other methods would have revealed. And we also have some sharp improvements in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio, where the types of white non-college voters who are answering polls weren't um, Republican enough or where pollsters weren't waiting by white sort of college education. Um, and, uh, and like I said, that works in back testing in 2016, but our model is really no more accurate in 2020 because these pollsters, like online pollsters such as YouGov, who we work with at The Economist, that are trying to force their samples to have the right share of 2016 Trump voters, are still talking to unrepresentative samples of Americans in the current moment. Trump voters in the past, in this case, who were likely to vote for Biden likely to vote for Biden um, than reality suggested was true. So our prediction for the Electoral College in 2020 looks like this, where you know our, our average prediction is that Joe Biden should win about 340, 350 Electoral College votes. In the reality, he only wins 306. So we give him a 97% chance of winning, when in reality, he probably act closer to like a 70% chance um, if you adjusted the polls for their biases. So one more lesson. <clears throat> polls individually can be biased. Lower response rate increase, uh, lower response rates increase the chance of non-response in the individual polls. And evidently, aggregation doesn't fix that problem. Because non-response affects all the polls at the same time. Individual polls, regardless of the way they're conducted, can be biased by the same 
underlying problems of non-response um, by political group. So one more trick for 2022. If this isn't going to work, what should we do? Well, I, I'm going to do something called conditional forecasting, where instead of assuming that the polls are going to be completely unbiased on average, that they're going to meet their traditional sort of benchmarks for error, um, I'm just going to ask the computer to tell me what the election looks like if the polls are biased two or three or four percentage points toward the Republicans. So that's what we've done at The Economist in recent weeks. We take the Senate polls in places like Arizona and Pennsylvania and ask the computer to sort of average the polls as if they're all biased by the same amount that they were biased in 2016 and 2020. To play this hypothetical game of election prediction. Election prediction if the past rules of polling are broken, if the violation of the suit principle is consequential. And that allows us to prepare for you know, maybe eventual scenarios where polls are biased, or maybe, maybe they're good, and all the elections fall at the uh, current average, the light blue line on this graph. Uh, but it would, it is really nice to know what the election would look like if, if they're biased again. Um, and then we rerun our simulations. Then we say, okay, well, explore the historical range of errors for election prediction, just assuming that the polls are biased, and then that spits out our traditional probabilities. And today, say you run the 538 average instead of, actually, this is, a, this is from a few weeks ago, um, but instead of the Democrats having a 80% chance of winning, they now have a 60% chance of winning, if you just assume that the polls are as biased as they were last time. Um, and the advantage of that is not necessarily statistical. I don't think after 2020 and 2016 that we can solve the problems in polling by averaging them together or by forecasting elections and giving people probabilities. What I'd rather do is explain to people like this, if these past patterns of bias hold, what should they expect in the election forecasts or what should they expect from the polls? And I think that this is a little more helpful. But what if we want accurate polls again? What can, what can the pollsters do? Well, if going to people where they are by mail or knocking on the doors isn't gonna work, um, there's not really a whole lot of other options. Um, these are a few problems, like what, what if you still have too many Republicans answering the polls, polluting what statisticians call the data generating process of the poll? What if we get a lot of polls from partisan outlets or lower quality firms because the better firms just abandon the enterprise entirely. Um, maybe some better answers or questions to answer are, what should we be expecting from this instrument, right? If I have to do this whole exercise to see what the election looks like, if polls are biased, then maybe I should just be expecting less from the polls. Maybe I should be not counting on this sort of laser-like predictive error in election prediction, and maybe I should be using them for something else, like measuring what people want from their leaders, trying to gauge their support for government and anticipating what the people want from their government. And that's what the rest of my book is about, about how those work and why we need them. Let's go. Thanks. So I am tasked, am I seeable? Yes, I'm tasked with giving about a 10 minute response um, to the ideas in the book. And the presentation though? Yeah, sure. I might point to that. No, no, we can no it's good. Go. No, 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 just a second. Anything to take the focus off me generally. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but, but it's okay. But I do want to put a plug in you know, for this book. I think it really is a terrific read and it has a lot to teach us and to think about. So I found the book incredibly engaging for sort of two reasons uh, that I think you should consider. Um, one of which it has amazing stories, like stories that like resonated with me. Like I'm not fully in the polling world, but I totally like love data and I'm a data neural nerd, right? And you know, to be able to, so most people know who Nate Silver is. If you're a political scientist, you've heard of Doug Rivers, right? Charles Franklin, there's lots of these cameos that show up from different worlds um, the Nate Silver story is particularly important to me because as anyone who knows me knows, I am like the least connected person in the world, but I knew who Pablano was before almost everyone in the world because his parents lived around the corner from me 
And Sally Silver was like my favorite community activist. And we were walking together. She was like, ooh, ooh, my son's Poblano. Ooh, ooh. And I was like, I know something before. It was, it was very good because he was a mystery pollster before. Yeah. Um, so there's these great stories that I think absolutely tell a compelling narrative about the use of polling in democracies. And the book actually starts not with sort of the techniques of polling, but sort of why we need it. Like, why is the voice of the people important? And a defense of that, I think, very deeply for democracy. And I think it's, it's, very, it's a very compelling question, right? Where the book has, I think, important answers to teach us, right? That, that's one. Number two is it lays out with an authoritative tone, but just a, a very clear like metaphor. Polling and poll aggregation and forecasting are two different things, right? So the, you know, the I, I sort of think about it as pollsters, like you can think about sending out kind of drones, right? Out their probes into the world, right? And they bring back answers. And there's different technologies of how to do that. And the, the drones used to go through wires, right? And now they're they're wireless. And even they used to be in person on the streets of New York City, right? As as we saw where aggregation is really about after some of those results have come in, sort of looking across screens and seeing how to learn um, across the information that comes back from those and then broadcasting that. But they're two different things. They're both so complicated now, right? They're so complicated. But don't we have to understand it, right? To the extent that polls are in the headlines of the news, to the extent that we condition our behavior as citizens on what other people think, should probably understand how that's collected, which parts we trust and don't trust. And I think Elliot gets at this at the end of the talk a little bit, of trying to provide people almost like dashboards kind of, of how to think about the world conditional on different priors and beliefs. And his walk through that in the book is terrific, right? And it's really, it's, it's really, really valuable. Um, and so I think like the part where I would completely agree with, so if the title of the book is Strength in Numbers, right? The part that I'm super happy like to like support is weakness without numbers. Right? I think that like the book makes that case like really well that we shouldn't give up on polling because of some of the things that it doesn't do. Because half of the things we think it should do, it shouldn't do in the first place, right? It is noisy, um, it is a sample. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about you know, some of those things um, in a second. But you know, additionally, like we need to know how people feel. Elections aren't particularly useful democratic devices and we're thinking about real-time representation and understanding. I think he makes that case, you know, like very, very well. And so if we don't have numbers of which polls represent one way of doing it, right, we are really at a loss. And so when we see this declining, you know, response rate for polls, um, this should concern us. There's a sensor of democracy that's, if not turning off, right, the signal to noise ratio, right, is, is maybe a little bit different. And we need to invest in, in, in thinking about that. Second, like, well, how do we educate people to do that? Which is this book, I think, puts an effort into doing uh, about what does uncertainty mean in the polls? What does it mean when you see these numbers? And in particular, how we get beyond the margin of error. Um, so this, while I'm not a pollster and I'm not a poll aggregator, right? I spend a lot of time thinking about uncertainty and predictions of political violence and other inferences. You know, how do you communicate um, to non-statisticians what the output, like an outcome of a model is when they are going to make a decision based on the numbers that you tell them. Um, and so it's definitely like having the numbers, understanding what they mean, right? There's definitely weakness without numbers. And then maybe the part that I would wanna like add that's in the book, but maybe that my response will kind of be framed around a little bit is, but whose numbers? Um, like, which I think is, is something you know, that's worth like thinking uh, about, right, deeply, because we come back to sort of one word in the book and the talk, and it's both the sort of strength and weakness of these things, which is representativeness. That what we want with polls is we want to see, right, something that we don't see. We want to make inference about something. Like we want to be sort of better detectives to solve some mystery that we don't have an obvious solution to. So that could be what issues people care about, right? It could be who's going to win the election, right, in a particular case, right? And it's going to turn out to be the case that there's this what's known as the, the fundamental theory of inference. You can't do that without assumptions, right? So you can have data and you can have evidence and it can be qualitative or it can be quantitative, but the things outside the data, the assumptions that led to the model, both its limits and its empowering are what's going to let you, you know, sort of see the future. That's what's gotten that combination between the two has gotten incredibly complicated um, for that. So let's take, do I have a couple more minutes? Let's take the polls are necessary but imperfect, right? So we're all clear, they're snapshots, 
right? What we really want maybe from polls is to sign up, have like a real world episode, like on MTV in like the nineties, right? On a particular <laughs> issue and like deeply understand and follow like who was dating who in that issue space. Like that's really what we want, but instead we get some like fuzzy Polaroid, right? Picture like of what's there. And you know, that's better than not having the Polaroid picture for evidence, right? And, and what exists in inference, but it's maybe not, you know, everything we want. We know it's a sample, right? So even the estimation that Polaroid right, isn't actually all of the data, right, of people and what we can run. It's a sample of it. And so we know there's going to be randomness involved in that. And then the thing I think I, I love about the narrative of the book that comes out particularly towards the end is how technology has shifted under the feet of pollsters, right, that there's certain assumptions about how we reach people, sort of the techniques that those probes are following, the strengths and weaknesses of those drones that bring back information that has evolved a lot over time. The polling industry is sort of amazing for still being able to do as well as it does with the shifts that have happened in the technology of reaching people and getting their attention, right? I think that is, I think that is absolutely um, fantastic. But how do we teach people what polls are today, right? So in coming up with a computational social science major, in polling, um, I guess I'll call out my colleagues, right? Even most faculty in the social sciences can't correctly interpret a confidence interval, right? And talking about information is incredibly difficult. Right to do precisely, and you know maybe we can get into the Q and A sort of about like how to do this a little bit. But if we want to get people to understand the strengths and weaknesses of polls, what we're really saying is we want people to understand uncertainty, right? Uncertainty around these inferences and where that comes from. And I think it's a very complicated topic that ultimately gets into trust, um, which is a second thing I'll get to. The second takeaway is yeah, polls aren't perfect, right? But um, we need them for democracy and particularly issue polls, not necessarily horse race polls. And we don't have maybe you know anything better than that. Um, so I, I totally agree with that. It's weakness without numbers, but there's several lines in, in the book um, where uh, there's the discussion of like polling gives the public a megaphone, right? And there's like to, to say what they want and don't want. And I think one point of discussion to think about, particularly when we're talking about representativeness is actually pollsters have a ton of power, right? Just like aggregators have a ton of power. And I think there's a bit of a problem in the communication business of this stuff when we take away the perspective of the people that are doing the collecting the analysis, right? And so the idea of conditional forecasting and putting a little bit of perspective back in is super valuable, right? For I think foreshadowing and giving people like sort of highlighting like that fact that there's choices being made, but there's so many. Um, that are there. And so this that sort of leads to that second part of, well, who's questions, right? Think about a pollster. They decide what questions. They also decide what answers, right? You're allowed to, they literally define the vocabulary you're allowed to express your interest in. Why are you asking this and not something else, right? We also can't necessarily say that people's measurements of attitudes is completely independent from the survey itself, right? Talking to someone and asking them a question forces them to think about that, which then they condition their response on, right? So there's feedback effects that go on. In fact, a really interesting, terrific part of the book is about influence, about using polls to sell messages, right? Back and forth. And so I absolutely believe we need to get polling back up to be a useful measurement, right? To guide representation and accountability. We also have to understand these feedback effects that there's a horse race over issues, right? When we measure like who likes what, there's not necessarily the truth or usefulness value we're measuring. We could be measuring the, the um, horse race of who's gotten their message out the most, right, at a particular time. And so I think we need to nest all of these conversations and polling what they are for democracy into larger discussions of social learning and problem solving more generally. But this is a huge, crucial part, right, of the discussion. The book absolutely, I think, moves us, right, to thinking about all the right questions and gives and puts together really, really important parts of the history and the future, right, of both polling and forecasting. Thanks. So um, we'll just open it up for Q&A and I'll let you just call on people as, as whenever you're ready. Okay, go for it. First hand. Yeah, yeah thanks for this. Um, for both of you. <laughs> So I, I guess my, my question is on sort of the forecasting side of things, right? And thinking about how hard it is to predict model turnout. So I, I don't really catch whether you talk about this much, but your thoughts on kind of predicting turnout. And then a sort of a related question is that is thinking about you kind of forecast the primary election that becomes even harder. So turnout in terms of primary voters is also harder too. So I don't know if you have thoughts on what it is. 
Yeah, so I'll take your question in reverse order. On um, primary polling, I don't really pay attention to it. Um, like, like you're saying, predicting turnout is hard. And in a primary, that's basically the whole ballgame because turnout is so low. Um, more importantly, uh, and this is a bit technical, um, but the, the, when I was talking about these demographic benchmarks, right, for, that the pollsters use, those are all chosen to maximize predictiveness of general elections. And when you make sure that a poll has, for example, the right share of Americans or registered voters by age and sex and race, you might not be establishing a representative sample of, say, Democratic primary voters. Um, so the way pollsters get around that is just asking people, are you a Democratic primary voter and are you likely to vote? Which has a lot of measurement error in it. And that's the biggest problem with, um, with those polls in particular, is that letting people tell you that they're likely to vote is not necessarily a good predict. So I'll give you an example. So about 85% of people in our polling before 2020 said that they were gonna vote and turnout was only 60%. So like there's 15 or 25% of people basically lying to us or overestimating. Maybe maybe they were gonna vote and they don't and they don't. Um, but, uh, and, and those people, I, maybe evidently they were too democratic last time around. So that's why the polls underestimated um, Republicans perhaps. So yeah. Um, I, I like to think of the polling error, though, since you bring up likely voter filters, as a function of two things. It's failure to identify the likely voter electorate, which, for what it's worth, is really hard. You don't know what the electorate's going to be until election day. You can't measure it directly. You can only predict it, and then it vanishes. It's gone. You can't capture that again. So, so that likely voter prediction is hard. Um, and then there's the second plank, I guess, of the par part of the error, which is the non-response among everyone, registered and likely voters, which recently have been Republicans, though for what it's worth, I don't think there's necessarily a reason we should always expect those people to be Republicans. It's more of an argument for higher higher error bars, as, as Michael said. So does that answer your question? Yeah, in front, I guess, or? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. We talk about national polls, <clears throat> excuse me, but we don't care about national because there's no national vote. It's electoral college in the state. So really, we need 50 different polls yeah. to establish the truth. And I noticed in your slide that in Pennsylvania, you estimated the overage of the Pennsylvania Democrat was by 4%. So you had reduced. And Wisconsin was like 6 to almost 10 to 9%. Right. Why does it vary so greatly from state to state? The polling error. Yeah, yeah, that error or even the bias. It's, imp it's important. This is the statistical concept. It's important that the error is all in the same direction across the states. That's a bias towards Democrats. Um, I, so in the case of Wisconsin, the polls are particularly hard because the registered voter lists don't indicate whether or not someone's a Republican or a Democrat. So when a pollster does their poll, they can't make sure there's a representative sample of registered Republicans or registered Democrats. So that is a sort of unique explanation for Wisconsin that doesn't apply to the other states. And so the problem I think in all states is that state pollsters don't have as many resources as national pollsters and the benchmarks are imprecise. So whereas we have the Census Bureau telling us that the share of Americans nationally is this percent or X percent, and we do have access to state level data the state level estimates of the share of people in the electorate are actually more imprecise at the state level. They come from smaller sample sizes. They come with higher errors from measurement, like like we're saying, how are you asking who's educated, you know, how people are college educated or what have you. Um, uh, and there's also the third point is there's fewer of them. So in our averages, they do benefit from more surveys. Like I'm trying to emphasize. Having more surveys is not perfect, but does get you somewhere. And in Wisconsin, in the past, in, in the last 30 days in 2016 in Wisconsin, you have three polls. So just naturally, you're going to have more uncertainty there. Does that answer your question? Yes. Sir. Yeah, but I, I would, I mean, I would agree. I, what I would really like is for a national pollster to embark on a like 50 states or maybe even 10 states project, where instead of doing these national surveys, they do state surveys. 
and the Times did that in 2018, and to some extent in 2020. But you know, having one, as we've seen, having one pollster do that is not a silver bullet. So. Jen had her hand up first. Yeah. Um, just really briefly, um, a lot of the challenges that you described with um, the algorithms and the raking um, algorithm, the weighting, and all of that um, really seems to be driven by like a substantive concerns that you know post uh, you know after the elections. Everybody looks and says, oh, we missed this thing. But so often the thing that was missed is actually, you know, seems quite obvious the day after the election. Yeah. And you know, I just wonder how someone who's in your position is, you know, running through all this data. Um, do you look at focus group discussions? Uh, because I just wonder that is there a bridge between the, uh, the statistical work that you do and a lot of the qualitative work and the focus group discussions that are really able to help people you know, before elections pick out some of the issues of substance yeah. substance of concern that you might not pick up in polls for the very reasons that you described because the, the, the questions you have baked you have the answers already baked into them you're already waiting based on you know your understanding of what's important about population characteristics but focus groups and other forms of qualitative data collection can tell you something else about you know, causal mechanisms or other things that you might not be looking at. So I'm wondering to what extent you rely on those kinds of data as you think about weighting, as you think about aggregating. So the first thing I'll say is, I think you're right that pollsters have missed something obvious in, before some elections. And in fact, one of, one of the stories in the book is the story of a pollster in New Hampshire who says after the 2016 election, after their polls estimate that Hillary Clinton would win by 10 percentage points in the state, that, uh, and they forgot to weight their poll by education. He says, well, we never had to do that before, so we didn't do it this time, which I actually, I think that errors on them totally. They should have thought through that. And there are some resource constraints with pollsters. Obviously, they're doing a ton of work. The research and the gathering of the data is really hard, but like, that's on them. I think, um, and that's not necessarily a quantitative problem. That's like a failure to explore all your options. Uh, in my work, I don't look at focus groups pretty much at all, um, but I do talk to some of the private pollsters who do focus groups. And I'd say some of them have an idea for where, for example, the you know polls might be missing support among some groups, um, but I, you know, the political science sort of studies of how accurate these things are doesn't necessarily lend a whole lot of confidence to extrapolating those findings to the whole country. Um, but, uh, you know, if, uh, if a focus group wants to give the economists free access to sitting in on a focus group, <laughs> I would do it. That's the other thing, too, is they're much more expensive than actual tools, too. I think there was a, yeah, in the back. Sorry, you had your hand up for a while. Mine? Yeah, you were saying. Okay, thank you. No, so, um, I guess mine has to do a little bit with the difficulty on forecasting on a somewhat different uh, situation. So I'm a lot of, I'm not an expert on forecasting. A little bit that I have seen is done in the US, right? And America has, you know, two specific features. It has the, the electoral college, right? And then a two party system. So I was wondering what, like, if this would, what would be the situation for a forecasting model? If you did not have an electoral college, so you can work with the national vote, or if you have a multi-party system, so it's less of a clear than force rate. So, like, what are the effects of this in different countries? Like, do you think it will be easier or harder? Yeah, the the elect the United States electoral system is a bit of a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, it makes the modeling really fun, because you have to, you know, like just as a sort of nerd, like you have to play through all the different <laughs> situations, like what's the value of the electoral college in this state, blah blah. So, that's fun. Um, it, it makes the election forecast sort of more worthwhile because the story is bigger and more, um, but it does make polling bias more important. It makes our understanding of the likely contest of an election more inaccurate or have a higher margin of error. Um, and then in some of the other countries, we do polling averages and election forecasts. And so we do this in France and in Germany, which have, you know, in France, it's just proportional. So 
the national polls decide or directly measure or indirectly measure technically the um, outcome without the extra step of the electoral college. Uh, so if you have you know a million national polls, you're just kind of it's easier to sort of predict. Um, and then in Germany, you have the mixed sort of half of the legis half of the legislature is uh, the Bundestag is proportionally allocated in half of its single member districts. So it's similar there. Um, I mean, it's easier. It's easier everywhere else, basically. Um, that from the forecaster's perspective, the polls I should say are not necessarily better there. So in France. The expected error for a poll, the average error historically, is about two percentage points on vote share. And in America today, it's like one and a half or one, depending on how you count it and stuff like that. So they're about twice as bad. Um, but it's an easier, it's an easier thing to forecast. You see what I mean? So there's a bit of a trade-off. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. The Economist does have forecasts for other countries, though. We have France, Germany, we have Brazil right now. We'll have the UK and India later, which I am India is a huge democracy and I have to figure out how to do that. So <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts about that? We do have three online questions. Oh cool. Um, somebody asks, is 538 the best polling information source or would you recommend a different <laughs> polling information source? <laughs> uh, I think there's a variety of perspectives. Um, I I I I'm young, I'm 26. So I actually grew up listening to Nate Silver in 538. The reason I'm a political analyst is because I like, you know, fell in love with political data by forecasting it. And like the, you know, the Iowa electronic market is another example of political prediction. So um, I, and I, and I think in the book this comes out too, is like the role that the people at 538 have played has been pretty revolutionary in understanding polls. So all the credit to them. I think what they miss and expressly what sort of they say in their philosophy of polling is, is they say it's not worthwhile to interrogate every single data point, to understand the data generation process behind every survey. And that if you average them together, that avoids the pitfalls that individual surveys can fall into. And I think as we've seen, that philosophy is wrong. There are some pollsters that are better than other pollsters. Not all the data are created equal. So I would say to the online commenter, uh, I wish that perspective was a little more acknowledged by the polling analysis community. And then, um, uh, and, 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 you know, there is a danger to taking every data point that you that you get. I mean, partisan polls are notoriously opaque. They're not transparent with their methods or the purposes for why they're releasing surveys. Um, so even though 538 does tend to have really pretty good estimates, Conditional on the inherent uncertainty of these tools, you know, there's um, there's a lot of stuff you're missing. Uh, there's a question in the back in person. Should we alternate? Yeah, we can alternate. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I wonder if part of what's going on with the poll being bad is that the sort of approach is that we should really take them like literally, right? That if we had a large enough line of quality poll, that should really be the number that we predict, right? And I wonder if a different way to think about the role of polls and it's basically to say we should shift the number in the fundamentals model up or down, not necessarily toward the number in the poll, but use some sort of directional information from the polling versus the actual number, which in a way means it's more like, are they relatively right and not absolutely right? I wonder if that perspective might sort of avoid really just trying to fix these polls that seem to be getting sort of worse and worse. So, so are you saying if um, we observe, for example, in 2022, 2022, that our fundamentals prediction says whatever, D plus two, and the polls say R plus five, that we should shift the fundamentals expectation because of the difference or? Uh, More something maybe comparing the polls relative to each other to say that I think if you see a D plus two and the polls say R plus five, probably you think we should move the poll somewhere in the Republican direction, but not necessarily to R plus five, right? Like, to me, the limiting case is, imagine that R plus five poll you observed was like an infinitely large sample size. You don't necessarily think it should be R plus five, right? right. The model would say it should be R plus five. Then you think actually we should pull it in that direction, but not take it so literally as like the truth in the world. But yeah. there's some other way of 
fillet this sort of pork. So on the slide, uh, and I, I don't really know how to pull it back up, but it doesn't really matter, um, of the 2016 election, you'll see we have a, you know, a point for the result in every state, and then three other points. There's a hybrid point, a combination of the polls and the fundamentals, the fundamentals only and a polls point. And that's because our model, the way we built it is Bayesian, and it does what you're saying. It sort of picks the middle point between the fundamentals and the polls. I mean, it technically is like doing the compl complicated weighting that you understand of figuring out how much extra predictive power is in the polls based off of their historical record and comparing that to the statistical power or the, the information based off of the historical record of the fundamentals. Um, and it's picking, you know, the sort of Bayesian combination of those two things. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Um, that's not easy to understand. And it's not easy to communicate to people. Um, and so I think we, and maybe election forecasters are doing this right, but what I think is the sort of political journalism world is getting this dramatically wrong and reporting new Washington Post poll says B plus, or new New York Times poll says R plus three, right? Without revealing the contextual factors or the uncertainty in the headline. So really, I mean, maybe our model is well calibrated or whatever across the hundred elections we'll see in, 80 more elections, if that's the case. But we can't control, I guess, a lot of the externalities of how people interpret the polls. In, in, in the perfect world, and this comes from the book, I think we would understand surveys as a result of this really complicated scientific and artful process where people have control over, like, literally, literally how people are vocalizing themselves. Um, and then all of the other problems in the sort of scientific process we were discussing earlier with sampling and weighting um, and modeling. Um, and, and, and maybe political reporters could think about polls as single observations that point you in the right direction toward the truth of public opinion or what have you. But at the end of the day, that is not as sexy headline as <laughs> B plus three or R plus three. Oh yeah, well ping pong, so online. <laughs> All right. Uh, this question is a bit of longer. It's a Harvard professor, Jill Lepore, in her book, Big Ben, about the Simulmatics Corporation activities in the 1960s in gathering information about voters rather than simply asking them how they would vote to make predictions about and thereby influencing campaign strategy of candidates in elections, warned us about the over reliance on such methods. Should we be concerned? And if so, why? Yeah, I think we should absolutely. I think we should be concerned on the over um, estimation of the precision of these methods, whether or not that's the sort of people machine that Joe Laporte talks about, um, or uh, whether or not that's just an over reliance on polling data by campaigns. By the way, that's the sort of predominant use. Most campaigns don't have their own analytics team. They just, the candidate just talks to a pollster, and that's how they sort of, and that's how they sometimes make decisions. Um, in the book, though, and in the sort of history of how people use polls produced by Laporte herself and some other historians, it's clear that politicians aren't picking their positions based on the polls. Mm -hmm. They are choosing what to emphasize for the most part, choosing what things they believe in to emphasize that they believe are popular based on the polls. Um, uh, what, you know, what things to put in their campaign speeches that they think people are popular. And then sometimes in the case of Richard Nixon, for example, they will pick a new position or dramatically change course if the public gives them a really negative rating on something or a squarely against them, but that's pretty rare. So what actually this story of the Semiomatics Corporation is in the book and my opinion of it after sort of reading all this polling literature and doing my own polling is that it's a bit, pessimistic about how people can abuse these data, but more importantly, it dramatically overestimates the influence of polling data and pollsters on, on candidates. And that, that's in the book, so. There's an addendum to that question too. Oh, cool. Starting to touch on there, but do you think that symbolmatics played a significant role for better or worse in the US conduct of the Vietnam War? Oh, that's a really interesting story. Um, so this corporation that like gathered old polling data and then created statistical models to predict 
for example, whether or not people would be more likely to vote for John F. Kennedy if he gave a speech on civil rights. Also went to Vietnam. The like survey nerds like me went there and like had you know employees asking um, you know Vietnamese people in the wilderness in cities if they, for example, approved of the U.S. war in Vietnam. Like the person with the clipboard asking the Vietnamese person in English and having it translated. Um, so you can see how that process would go wrong. Dramatically overestimates probably support for US intervention um, in Vietnam. And I think there, yes, the Simulmatics Corporation probably steered US policy in the wrong direction, but so did any other number of factors like what the U.S. government wanted to do, and that's kind of, the, and that's the story also of Afghanistan, where we have surveys of people on the ground, of which Afghanis are in, in Iraq, um, and uh, and again, we see that polls are kind of abused to this end, and the end is kind of already decided by, by policymakers or decision makers. Yeah. Yeah, I have two questions. So the first one is about aggregation. So you spoke about in, in your book. Too. So one of the things that you do when you aggregate is the quality of the poll as compared to the sampling measurements and the variety of criteria. So, so how do you take into account the timing of polling? Like one would imagine that a poll comes out first, a poll is and the results and what what people do with those results online or spreading the information that comes out of that poll influences the poll that comes up quickly. So how, how does that enter at all into the aggregation and uh, really breaks the part of the poll? So that was one question. And the other one connected to what Michael was saying. So you, you showed a graph saying how polling rate, the response rate of polls. So much so has anyone looked into the reason? Is that there are too many polls right now? And then mm -hmm. Each poll has just a lower uh, response rate, or, That's is interesting. It, or is it that? Uh, plus, I mean, polling is expensive, right? So, if there is a proliferation of polls, who's paying for all of this? Yeah. And how does that influence the sorts of polls that get made? The sorts of questions that are asked, and what Michael was saying. So, again, something that's not necessarily in the book is the discussion of this bandwagon effect, where people would observe the results of the polls and then change their behavior. Um, and there's some research on this that, for example, if you call people and ask them their, you ask half the people their opinion on something, and then the other half of people you say, here's the result of a poll on the same question, now what's your opinion, that it moves people modestly in the direction of public opinion, um, but not so high. So there's a reason for me to expect that there would be consequences of publishing a poll first in the aggregate and then taking another poll. The good news is, we just don't really observe that when we're aggregating data. Um, but the strict answer to the question is the model doesn't know about that at all. And it doesn't seem to matter in predicting election outcomes, but it might matter for other things. Um, you, could you could definitely do more research in academics in, into bandwagon effects. Um, and surveys offer some exciting experimental ways to do that. Um, uh, on the sort of sec secondary questions, so response rates for polls have fallen because people are less likely to answer polls, Tell whether or not that be by telephone or SMS text or email, not because there's more polls being asked. Um, it's not like you get a call from a pollster and you answer it, and then you get another call from a pollster and you say, oh, I already talked to one. Because there's so many people in America, if you call a thousand people, your odds of getting called again for another poll just by, you know, inherently are tiny, unless you're in a congressional district in a competitive state in yeah, a contested that, election. But I mean that you right can poll for X, but you receive polls for so many other things. You look at your polls for so many other contested topics. Yeah, so I, so I think there, I mean, I hypothesize that there's a sort of long-term decline in willingness of people to talk to strangers there's evidence that shows people are less trusting of strangers or of institutions. So maybe they just don't want to talk about politics to people on the phone that are randomly calling them. There's another problem that's technological, which is we have call blockers on our phone for spam now, and pollsters get marked as spam most of the time. 
Um, so landline completion rates by pollsters, I believe, are much higher than cell phone completion rates, for example, because there's um, not as many call blockers on landlines. So that also contributes to the decline in response rates. But I think pollsters are more concerned about the first fact, first factor, which is people don't trust each other. They don't trust pollsters to give in or you know to be representing their opinion fairly, maybe. So and they just you know they're busy. They don't want to talk to you for 25 minutes about politics. Politics that is increasingly hostile and partisan. Uh, but all hypotheses can Yeah, online. Also about aggregating. This person says, I'm curious if there is a general principle that poll aggregators use to aggregate polls from different times, because during an election, polls were done at different time points, and there might be critical events, such as candidate scandals, that make polls fluctuate. The technical answer to this is that uh, the trait we're observing, support for a candidate, is allowed to vary over time in the model it's by a random walk process. Errors are autocorrelated. So that person wants to know all the technical details. That's how that works. Um, and then you know you can specify we can specify in our model that if we observe a big shift in the race across three or four polls, that that prediction of democratic support on average should shift by by a lot. So yeah, we just program it directly into the model and say if there's a big shift, it's a big shift. If it's random noise, it's random noise. Yeah, in the back. Uh, yeah. So. When you are trying to do polling in countries where it's not really that possible, like you mentioned Afghanistan earlier, what like techniques like pollsters or like people who use surveys do to kind of get the best results possible? Mainly it's in-person interviews, even today, um, even in countries with higher internet penetration in the Middle East, it's, it's almost entirely in-person interviews. There are some telephone pollsters. Um, the real weakness is that Actually, America is kind of unparalleled in the data it collects on its citizens, their demographic traits. The census is a pretty high response rate survey. And uh, this is in the beginning of the book, but that's a function of us being a democracy where our founding documents enumerate or mandate enumeration via a census. So, that, so polling is kind of a natural outcrop of that enumeration process. And you don't have that in lots of other, uh, lots of other countries. Uh, but the, the polls are done face to face. Um, for the most part, and they don't have great benchmarks for weighting, so um, uh, so it's harder to gauge how accurate they are. Yeah. Um, we'll talk later, but I've done surveys in Afghanistan. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's where I learned what ranking algorithms were. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Tried to weight like the people in Taliban-controlled territory versus not. I had to find a six, 10 years ago when uh, yeah. we were starting to do these. I got a statistician at, at, uh, at uh, RAND who could help me with this, but I didn't understand it but, uh, um, at that time. But question, um, Chatterman or Ox? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the conditional forecast, okay? If you think, if you think polls are on average unbiased, or that polls will have the distribution of errors that they've always had, then you should pick, you should pick Fetterman to win. If you think polls, the historical bias of polls, 1940 to 2012, is unpredictive of bias from 2012 onward, you shouldn't pick anyone. You should kind of be like, well, it looks like people in Pennsylvania are Democratic and Oz seems to have sort of lower favorabilities. Maybe it's because he's from New Jersey or whatever it is. But these are, these are imprecise tools in an era that's really hard to pull people. I mean, I would put a couple dollars on Fetterman. I wouldn't put my life savings on him. Sorry. Yeah, Michael, sorry. Yeah, thanks. So I guess you, you brought this up. So we've been talking about bias and polls, but you brought up errors a couple of times and without getting too like nerdy and wonky, right? Like people tend to think of errors as like the bell shaped normal distribution. Right. There's lots of discussions about fattening of tails mm -hmm. um, to take in some of the uncertainties, right? That exists beyond sampling. So the sort of art, right? Versus the science and trying to internalize Right, that which leads to it's not necessarily bias, right? Like you just get less certain about what the prediction are. You get closer to the maximum entry entropy prediction, right, of like the two candidates in fifty fifty. Yeah. So you're like sort of 
your point estimate goes back right to the middle, right. right? But generally, like the way you would draw, right, your conditional forecasts, right? So that, like, I guess what I'm trying to get at the question is, aren't conditional forecasts only like one part of the uncertainty you're trying to get around, like communicate to people, right? Because that's kind of about like the mode. Right. And isn't another part of what you're trying to get at, right? The, exactly, the shape. Right, of yeah. either the error bands or the fans like around it, or if you looked at the distribution just with predicted vote share, right, or margin on the x axis, like that shape. Yes, it is only one part. Um, but uh, I'm just sort of thinking through this in my head. Um, but what I think is important, so mathematically, I think we have a pretty good handle on the shape of the distribution of errors historically. That's a pretty, it's kind of a fat T distribution. It's not, not a Cauchy distribution. It's not, you know, super fat or anything. Um, uh, and I, and what I think you can't quantify is the shifting of bias patterns over time. So yes, while I think there might be more uncertainty, like the distribution might be a little bit different for error of the individual surveys or even of averages, I think it's changing probability much higher. I think probability of uniform bias that needs to be communicated. Is that? What do you think about that? Uh, so I think like so, uh, but they're both projected onto like the same prediction, right? It's not like you make a separate prediction of where the center is and then a separate prediction of the variance around, right? It, right? Or at least we can artificially just look at the posterior distribution of the right. two. So that seems like a Quarter so, <laughs> like, uh, yeah. so what we do is we just sort of like present the two options. Yeah. Um, I think if you want, if you want to formalize the model, um, that becomes a lot harder. You probably have to assume a new distribution of potential bias, and then, and then that would in turn give you a fattening of the tail. Yeah, I think that's if right. If we did Markov change or something, um, but we haven't formalized it yet. We're in the sort of like present the alternatives to people stage. Because like, look, if I give someone a, it's a forecast today, assuming no step change in the amount of bias in the polls from 2012 to now, that says Democrats are gonna, you know, 80% to win or 75% to win or something. And then I do this conditional forecast and stuff where I like, you know, where we add the uncertainty parameter around the bias of the polls. or we just simulate more elections assuming more bias in the polls. Maybe I'll have a, distribution that's fatter and shifted to toward 50 50 probably um, as we saw and then I just give them another probability that's like actually it's 65 percent mm -hmm. I'm not sure which of those is more helpful to people mm -hmm. I, I think it's the hand-holding version maybe, maybe it's the you know change in probability from 75 to 70 percent to 60 or 65 percent whatever maybe that does work over the long run but you know I, I do think forecasters are in the position where you should be making decisions for the short to maximize their short run um, ability to convey election probabilities and uncertainty in the polls, mostly the, the latter of those. Um, you know, it's kind of, I mean, we don't know if we're going to have 100 more elections in the United States, but even if, <laughs> if you step, <laughs> step back from that problem, like, you know, more technologies are going to come along in, in that position. and. Um, I think for pollsters, this really is like a, you got two or three more tries and then people are just gonna stop listening. So but if you have any ideas about how to formalize bias in the model, we should talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is um, this is more of an, uh, an open question, I think. So I wanted to go back to where you started. Um, so your, your book and your work is very invested in the ways in which uh, polling represents the voice in the will of the people. Um, you're also thinking a lot here about uh, how uh, extrapolative work of weighting um, increasingly maybe pulls away from pure surveying sampling methods of the past. And uh, so there's obviously a tension between those two things. Um, and at some point you get to like the law of small numbers, right? So yeah. when 
uh, when I first moved here, there was one other person in my department who was also from Mississippi and also had a PhD. We used to joke that like, we were the only two people in Pittsburgh from Mississippi who had PhDs. Right? And so like, if you extrapolated that and tried to do some sort of survey, like we're going to be the only two people in Pittsburgh who have from Mississippi with PhD. Right. And, and you know, there, there's ways in which that becomes both a data point, but as extrapolated, is not going to be highly representative because you're going to have to fatten it so much to take into account certain things, and you're also going to have to diminish larger population segments in order to balance things out. Right. So I'm wondering, like, how do you see these two things in tension and in conflict with one another when it looks as if, I mean, you tell me if this is wrong, increasingly, if you want to get what you need out of polls, we're going to have to keep tinkering and tinkering and tinkering with the weights so that what was, as you showed, not even very accurate in the first place, the kind of little just talk to people, talk to people, talk to people, was also not adequate either. So that's kind of where I uh, I think that's a false choice. And okay. my answer would be to emphasize to people the error, the unreliability in this tool at picking winners in 5149 elections, at being able to peg the opinions of the public within some two or three percentage point traditional margin of sampling error. Um, I mean, we know that that margin of sampling error, the traditional one is like at least half as big as it should actually be on the empirical research. It might be three times as small based on all these other factors like question wording and sponsor of the poll maybe. That sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I really wouldn't pick. I would just say pollsters, people who consume and report on polls, have to do a much better job at communicating how they're done and how much we should rely on them. I, I would say that there is lots of promise in not investing more in the modeling or the weighting side of the polls, but in this uh, sort of finding people where they are. So right. outreach. In the, in the design part of the poll, designing a good sample. So the Pew Research Center is doing this. This is the mail, the mail surveys I was talking about earlier. And their response rates for the mail survey are like 25, 30%. Um, and then they use the findings from those surveys to weight their lower response rate surveys on political identification, religious identification. And it might help. <laughs> but it's kind of like, you know, what's really, I mean, what comes out in the book is Polling moves forward after it breaks when people get and when people get creative. Mm -hmm. So I see this as the sort of pointing in the right direction. Okay. But uh, I, what I don't want people to do is go back to the 2016 mindset of election prediction of, you know, we can be right in all 50 states, sort of market the marketing of the election forecast in 2012. Right. It's probably always wrong. It's definitely wrong now. So. Any other questions? Okay. I mean, I'll just, I don't have anywhere to be. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for coming. The people who stuck around. <laughs>